Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Practical Engineering. Specifically this video on engineering the largest fusion reactor. This one was heavily requested and I'm excited to check this one out. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check it out. Friend Jade, creator of the Up and Atom channel. Up she and makes Atom. These incredible That's math awesome. and physics explainers that I absolutely love, and she recently got the opportunity to visit Eater in France. You may have seen this place in the news. 35 nations working together to build an enormous industrial scale nuclear This is a really cool reactor. place. The size of the project is mind-boggling. It's been under construction since 2013. And yep. I like construction. So when Jade and I were chatting about our tour, she said, why don't you make a video about it too? If everything goes to plan, Eater's tokamak reactor will house plasma at temperatures in the hundreds of millions of degrees, 10 to 20 times hotter than the center of the sun, hopefully paving the way for an entirely new form of electricity generation. I don't know much about superconducting coils or the reason why you got to get hotter than the core of the sun is the sun has all that gravity to help it out so you can get fusion at a relatively low temperature because you need you need three basic things high temperature high pressure and confinement time for fusion and well the sun has all that extra pressure and confinement from just gravity so on earth we need to make the temperature higher cyclotron resonance heating or breeder blankets but I do know it takes a lot of earthwork and steel and concrete to build the biggest nuclear fusion reactor on Earth. True. So let me give Just you like you need a lot of that to build anything. Of what might be the most complicated science experiment in human history. I'm Grady. And I'm Jade. And this is Practical Engineering. Today, we're exploring the ETA Mega Project. It's just the size of that thing. Oh, did she make it out of Legos? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I was fairly new to fusion when I went to visit, and although I'm still no expert, I still thought I should explain it. I think everyone's than fairly new to fusion. Before we dive into the mechanics, here's a question: Why is the world so interested in nuclear fusion? Basically, it comes down to the huge potential payoff. If we could harness the power of nuclear fusion here on Earth, it'd be a way more powerful energy source than fossil fuels without the environmental baggage. This water bottle full of seawater plus- And it's about on the order of three times more than a fission nuclear power plant. There's a lot of investments in new technology to get to that three times more. Now, I'm, I'm still all for fusion, but it's there's an old joke that it was uh, 20 years away, 40 years ago. And that's using it as a power source. It's been used as a weapon since the 1950s. That's what a thermonuclear or a hydrogen bomb is. One gram of lithium could provide electricity to a family of four for a whole year. Unlike nuclear fission, there's no long-lived waste and no chance that's of nuclear true. meltdowns. It's a clean, sustainable, and powerful energy source. That's true. Yeah, melting down, I mean, it's as simple as, you know, just shutting off your... Shutting down a fusion reactor is as simple as shutting off and as just opening a breaker. There's no decay heat. Now, it's easy to shut down a, fusion, a fission reactor, too, but it, with, with control rods. But the problem is the fission products still can generate, generate heat. And that's actually what causes meltdowns in events like Three Mile Island. It's just that heat just sits there. And, and uh, this all happened in Fukushima as well. They lost uh, cooling to their to their core after the reactors were offline. But that's not really a thing. Um, yeah, fusion products don't have that same, that same radioactivity and heat generation that fission products do. Scientists go so far as to say that commercial nuclear fusion is the next step for humanity. That's exactly what ETA, which translates to the way in Latin, aims to do. To nail down the technologies needed for a fully functioning commercial fusion I reactor. never made that connection for the Latin. For you to get an idea Latin, of but... how ambitious their goal is, they plan to input 50 megawatts of thermal power and get out 500 megawatts of fusion power. Again, that sounds like a lot, a time tense, and that's, we're talking just barely enough to be usable. So... The house loads of a nuclear plant, um, a, uh, I need to make a difference because I'm talking about nuclear fission. The house loads are probably less than 50 megawatts. Um, it depends on your design. The, one, the plant I worked at, let's, let's just say it was around 50 megawatts, was maybe, 
was maybe around 50 megawatts. That's about, in terms of just running all the, uh, the big pumps to a lot of its big pumps, such as reactor coolant pumps. Those are probably the biggest um, energy load to, uh, keep the re to keep the plant going. But the megawatts was 3,800. Now, maybe they're talking 500 megawatts electric, because that, but 3,800 megawatts thermal from the actual fission reactor. The, uh, the turbine was about 1,400 megawatts. So it'd be interesting to say if this 500 megawatts is from a turbine or just from the fusion reactor. A gain of 10 in fusion torque. Nothing close to this has so ever just been the fusion reactor. even attempted in fusion history. So since we're still using uh, steam turbines, then that's going to basically, on the grid, we're, we're having, what, 200 megawatts at best? So how are they going to do it? Right in here. So this is where the tokamak's going to be built. This is the tokamak pit, where ITA is assembling the largest nuclear fusion device in the world, a giant tokamak. Here's a man for comparison. It's going to be huge. A tokamak is a nuclear fusion machine that works by magnetic confinement. It will hold about 840 cubic meters of piping hot plasma. Why plasma? Plasma is what the hot. sun is primarily <laughs> made of, and it has the perfect conditions for fusion. To get fusion started in the ETA tokamak, two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, are pumped into a large donut-shaped chamber. This is just one of the six vessels that'll make up the chamber. So hydrogen, so you have hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe, but deuterium and tritium are both pretty rare. Though, what's interesting is you can actually get deuterium and tritium in a lot of wastewater because deuterium and tritium is just hydrogen with neutrons. Deuterium has one neutron and, and tritium has two neutrons plus the proton, hence you get, hence two and three, the name for deuter and trit prefixes. But in a light water reactor, you're you're bombarding water and everything else with neutrons, and there's a probability, albeit relatively low relative to fission and hitting control rods or something else, that it absorbs a neutron, so you end up with deuterium and tritium in, re in um, nuclear wastewater. It'd be interesting if we could recycle that somehow, but the processing cost just to get it out of there is kind of a pain. Interesting thing about the term uh, tokamak, um, when I went to school in Georgia Tech, uh, there was a group of people that would do a lot of fusion research. I wasn't one of them. I wasn't, I'm, I'm not a research person, but um, they would talk about tokamaks while going to their favorite uh, restaurant, Taco Mac. So the tokamak, Taco Mac. The fuel is heated to temperatures of up to 150 million degrees Celsius. When they fuse, yeah, the energy the they unleash is of epic proportions. But That's here's a, a weird animation. <laughs> How is it possible to contain so much plasma? No regular material can withstand Magnets. those kinds of insane temperatures. Imagine trying to hold onto a piece of the sun. These giant magnets this produce magnetic 10 times fields harder. of almost 12 Tesla, over 200,000 times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. 12 Tesla is a lot. We're talking, a lot of people compare it to Earth's magnetic field. Earth's magnetic field is actually not that strong in terms of Teslas, but it's just really, really big. Another thing to compare it to with that, at 12 Teslas, a lot of MRIs are either like one to three Teslas. So it's bigger and a lot more and a lot stronger magnetic field than an MRI. But how does this fusion stuff actually lead to electricity? ETA itself will not actually produce any electricity. It's our learning ground, an experimental hmm. arena to fine tune yeah. how a real reactor might operate. But in a real reactor, the walls of the tokamak will be filled with cooling fluid. When the deuterium and tritium atoms fuse, they release a neutron and a helium atom. About 80% of the energy released is carried by the neutrons, and being electrically neutral, they pass straight through the magnetic field. When these high-energy neutrons strike the tokamak walls, they heat up the fluid, turning it into steam. Then, just like a regular power yep. plant, the steam will spin turbines which will generate electricity. Basically the same way any power plant has worked in the past 200 years. Um, just good old-fashioned steam, like a nuclear fission reactor or like a coal plant from the 1800s. Something old, something new. But how will ITER heat the plasma to such insane temperatures? And when can we expect commercial nuclear fusion to get off the ground? Check out my video after you've finished watching Grady's and find out. <laughs> Jade's video goes into a lot more of the groundbreaking science at ITER, but all that science... I'm... I like seeing fusion, but yeah, the the joke is it's always 20 years away. So let's see, right right now that put it at 2043, crazy. Requires a lot of actual breaking ground. This is a bird's eye view of the whole facility. 
And this is where the tokamak lives. So if all the nuclear fusion is going to happen in there, what are all these other buildings and structures for? Fortunately, Support there's systems. a civil engineer there in France amongst all the technicians and scientists who knows the answer, and I was lucky enough to chat with him. This is Laurent Patasson, the civil engineering and interface section leader at ITER, and he's been there almost since the very beginning, including taking delivery of some truly massive pieces of equipment. So the largest one is the vacuum vessel sector, which is more or less 600 tons. Yeah. Wow. And which is 600 tons, we Yes, on the multi, multi wheel uh, truck. Yeah. That's comparable to how much a reactor vessel weighs. And this one, this is, that's pretty, that's bigger than I was expecting, especially considering this is a relatively low power reactor. Um, again, if we're talking 500 megawatts thermal, it's an eighth the size of the reactor I worked at, but the vessel is comparable in size. Uh, proceed. And with the protection around, it's like transferring, transporting an house two-story house, it's very large, right? So all the roads are closed. They are dismantling the, some uh, oh, yeah. traffic yeah. light just for the passage, some uh, some um, specific display, you know. The thing about any large pressure vessel is a lot of that is, at least within the US, and this, this is in France, but is outsourced because a lot, there's not that much heavy manufacturing you see in the US anymore. So it's always a new project. Um, this is going to sound a little pessimistic, but if an accident were to ever happen at a at a nuclear power plant that breaks a reactor vessel, probably just never going to start that unit up again. Like it would be in order to try to get one in there, it would almost be less expensive just to just to make a new one from scratch. Arin walked me through the whole. Now, the odds of that gave me an overview of how construction is progressing across the facility. Extremely low. Many of those big deliveries get stored in one of the many tents scattered around the site until they're ready to be installed, and then onto one of the various buildings. For example, the poloidal field coils that form superconducting magnets to help shape and contain the plasma in the reactor <laughs> are just too big to be completed big off -site and shipped to Eater, so instead they built a manufacturing facility right on campus in this long building on the south side. That's the thing with a lot of big stuff is a lot of things having to be manufactured on site. That's one of the advantages of small modular reactors is you you don't have to build them on site. I mean, compare this project to building a shed in your backyard, either from scratch, like going to Home Depot or whatever and getting all your and getting your wood, your screws, um, the siding you know, a door, all that stuff individually versus just getting a prefab one. The prefab one's going to save you a lot of headaches because it's like you try to build build one. It's like, oh, I didn't quite build enough. I got to go back and get some more. Ooh, I didn't account for this one, you know, funky, funky slope in my backyard. And yeah, there's a reason why um, modularizing stuff is better. But here you're dealing with something too big. This is first of a kind for just about every component, including this coil. So this needs to be done because it's 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 a big um, learning experiment for all of us. But eventually you'd like to see, you know, economies of scale, um, streamlined processes. So, you know, you don't have to do as much of this. Now, something of this size, you're probably already always going to have a, a facility on site, but you can get things a little bit more prop more uh, streamlined. Similarly, the cryostat workshop was built to assemble the massive vacuum tight structure that will surround the reactor and magnets. The cryostat parts, Big the poloidal field coils, and lots of other truly large pieces of equipment destined for the tokamak itself are then moved to the adjacent assembly hall as needed. Pretty much every part of the tokamak reactor is not only huge, but sensitive to environmental conditions too. So this building makes it possible to protect state. Wonder if all these buildings are temporary and they're going to go away after it's built. Worry about temperature or you'll probably, I mean, it's you'll probably keep of some the office buildings around. Building and longest building, 120 meter long, 70 meter high, very large, uh, 80, uh, 80 meter wide, and it's actually a very large place dedicated really for assembly purpose. That's about 21 stories tall and longer and wider than an American football field, in zones included. And maybe the most critical part of the whole building is what runs along the top of it. Cranes. We have two 700 tons of cranes. Oh my god. I didn't mention that. 
700 tons. So I think the, the cranes that we have, at least in our fuel handling building for when putting stuff in dry cast is only about 200 because these, the casts are about, a, are about 150. So yeah, 700, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty big. But those, those are coupled to transfer the modules of the machine, the central solenoid. So those are very impressive cranes. These two bridge cranes combine to become one of the largest cranes in the world with a combined capacity of 1,500 tons needed to assemble all the parts of the tokamak. That's and cool though, just tested and tested seeing how big this stuff is. Lift operation happens with dummy loads before they do the real thing. But material and equipment aren't the only things flowing through this project site. There's also a lot of electricity. Imagine what your utility bill would be if your toaster got as hot as the sun. Yes. Eater connects to the European power grid from a 400 kilovolt transmission line. During peak periods of plasma production, the facility may need upwards of 600 megawatts. That's the capacity of a small nuclear power plant. Obviously. Yeah. In fact, it's a, that's several small modular reactors. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? Having a bunch of it's like, so this is how fusion produces energy. We're going to have a bunch of small fission reactors. <laughs> Make up. So yeah, we can get, can get a fission fusion hybrid reactor. You can't just turn the reactor on with a flip of a switch. Eater has to coordinate with the power grid. Small modular reactors are on the order of 125 to 250 megawatts, though. So this would be several of them. <laughs> manager to carefully time the huge power draws with surrounding power plants to make sure it doesn't cause brownouts or surges on the grid. The 400 kilovolt line feeds a large switchyard and substation on the Eater campus. One thing I'm curious about is would fusion reactors have this, the same right of way as fission reactors? I think maybe they might because fission reactors, they don't exactly start up and shut down on a dime. Well, they can shut down quickly in an emergency, but for a nor it's more of, you can't turn them off and turn them back on on a dime. It's probably a better way of phrasing that because of things like xenon buildup. Xenon is a fission product that is reactor poison in that if you have a lot of xenon, you're going to have to wait a bit for that xenon to decay away. Otherwise, you can't you can't turn the reactor back on as well. That's one of plus several other technical reasons. A lot of it just due to it being a really, really big generator compared to the rest of the grid. But fusion, at least in this case, probably this case wouldn't because it's not a generator for for either because it's just an experiment. So it wouldn't. But let's say we did have commercial fusion right now. Um, I wonder if it would have this, I don't think it would have the same restrictions because there's nothing about, there's no equivalent of xenon in a fusion reactor that it can't start up and shut down because of that. And there's no, um, there's no fridge fission product risk as far as providing offsite power to them or equivalent. So, um, I don't think it actually would, but that we're, we're a ways away from that. <laughs> Electricity stepped down to a lower voltage using transformers. Then it flows through bus bars, cables, and breakers to feed all the various buildings and equipment. Like many electric that's that's very similar to a um, to the switchyard at a uh, fission reactor. Again, fission uses a fair bit of offsite power too. In fact, when the reactor is offline, it gets the um, thirty to fifty megawatts for house loads, like reactor coolant pumps, from the grid. And then once it start and then once it starts up, it actually it it would have the option to to either power its own house loads, you could cross connect it from the other unit. Though a lot of times it's typically left from the grid just because that's a that's a bit of an easier configuration. But either way, the net result is the same in terms of you're either paying for the grid to give you the stuff to the amount the amount you're paying is the same either way because you're you're paying for the stuff to start up and keep you going. Or once you're started up, you're going to supply your own power and make that much less electricity for the grid. So it's it doesn't really matter. Electronic devices, the superconducting magnets that surround the tokamak run on direct current DC. So the AC power from the grid has to be rectified. Yep. For a phone or flashlight, an AC to DC converter looks like this. Yes, they are now. So I'm not an electrician, but for whatever reason, you have the AC adapter that's big and bulky that can take up your entire, uh, you can take up your entire plug, or you can have the big and bulky one and a little plug on the outside so it doesn't take up your entire strip. That is one of the, the electrical mysteries that I've never fully understood. <laughs> but at Eater, it takes up two full buildings. The magnet power converter wow. buildings have enormous rectifiers. So 
fission plants and other power plants use use rectifiers as well for D, to DC power their instrumentation. But here, but we don't need that much DC power compared to fusion. So it takes up a few rooms in our electrical building, not entire buildings. Dedicated to each one of the magnet systems. Once energized, those magnets can collectively store upwards of 50 gigajoules of energy in their fields, though. So you also need That's a, a lot for to quickly get wow. rid of that energy if the <laughs> magnets lose superconductivity, called a quench. Fast discharge units, located in this building, allow ITER to dissipate that stored energy as heat in a matter of seconds. I guess you would need something for that much energy. So the magnets were... Uh, the magnets, are, I'm talking like small, like uninterruptible power supplies and instrumentation stuff. No bigger than you'd see at any other industrial thing. So yeah, in fission, you don't, you don't need those. But in fusion, I can see why. <laughs> there are also a lot of critical safety systems and parts to maintaining the expensive and delicate equipment at Eater that require power 24-7, 365. So there are two huge diesel generators that can provide backup power in case the grid goes down. Now that's the one thing that Fission has more of. Um, two is like your bare minimum, and each one can supply 100% of everything you need to shut down the nuclear plant. Uh, the plant I worked at had three, at plus additional strings of backup diesels in case you know this it, the, the the site is hit with an earthquake, a hurricane, basically the Fukushima style event, and other uh, and as well as other diesels that are stored on site that can be brought in by helicopter if necessary. Electricity is closely tied to the flow of heat through all the parts of ITER. Really, the whole thing is an experiment in heat, and there are so many ways things are being warmed or cooled throughout the campus. Of course, you have heating, ventilation, and air conditioning in all the buildings, and it's not just for the comfort of the people working in them. Even tiny temperature swings can affect the size of these huge components, complicating the assembly. HVAC systems are also very important for your instrumentation. Uh, the highest risk related system was actually our electrical buildings HVAC. And the main reason for that is because it keeps all of our electrical, comp it kept all of the electrical components as well as the critical instrumentation, some of which feed control functions and some of it are for post-accident monitoring within bands so or in so the indicators are actually reliable. And it's and if you lose that, just because it affects so many systems at once, that's why it's the highest, uh, has the highest risk multiplier. What we are facing uh, for civil is to, to merge at the end tolerances of equipment, which are at the level of millimeter, with tolerances of construction building, which is at centimeter. Ooh, that's when your tolerances are off. Mm, that I, I can see that being a problem. And the main challenge that we face in the past, and we are continuing to face, is that not to merge, but to make uh, compliant the tolerances um, scales. And it's not just temperature, but humidity and cleanliness as well. So Eater has a robust ventilation and chilling system located in the site services building, along with a lot of the other. Humidity is important because it can affect all of your electronic equipment. Um, too humid? Well, you can have humid. You don't want water and train in your sensitive electronic equipment. And not humid enough? Well, that's a static risk. Industrial support systems like air compressors, water treatment, pipes, pumps, and more. Heat is also important for the electromagnets, which have to be cooled to cryogenic temperatures so they act as superconductors. That's made possible by the That's a different level of critical cooling. Um, superconductors not used in a fission reactor. You just don't need anything that has superconducting capabilities for that system to work. So you're just you're gonna need multiple trains of things to keep it to keep things cold enough to, to maintain superconductivity since it's a critical part of maintaining a fusion reaction. Cryo plant. A, a cryo plant yep. installation of helium refrigerators. <laughs> liquid nitrogen compressors, cold boxes, and tanks that keep the various parts of the all those cold pipes. super cool during operation. But although some parts of the machine have to be cryogenically cooled to create nuclear fusion, you need to heat the plasma to incredible temperatures. And there's three external heating, heating systems at year. Yep. One, called neutral beam injection, fires particles that into the plasma awesome. where they collide and transfer neutral energy. Neutral beam injection. The other two, 
ion and electron cyclotron heating, say that three times fast, <laughs> use radio waves like huge microwave I'm sure there's a shorthand way to call it. Those are located in the RF heating building near the Tokamak complex. I'm sure all of these buildings are going to get renamed once plant operators get there, because that's just the way plant operators are. Um, the reactor containment building is often referred to as a big round thing, for instance. And then there's the matter of the heat output. The whole point of exploring nuclear fusion is to use it as an energy source, to convert tiny amounts of tritium and deuterium into copious amounts of heat. Eater's goal yep. is to produce a Q of 10, to get 10 times as much thermal energy out as it puts into the reactor. And here they're just talking about, they're just talking thermal because you're going to have to divide that by three when you get to, when you get to electrical production. So the Q factor, it's not used in, in fission, but like I said, the Q factor is closer to 100 than it is to 10 in terms of like how many house loads you have versus how much thermal heat you're actually producing in the reactor. So. Until you get the Q numbers higher than 10, that's, and that's why this is just an experiment. I don't see how you're going to be profitable, which is why this is, this is, a, this is a really big lab rather than a uh, power generation facility. But it is, you know, a noteworthy step. After all, you're gonna, you have to pass through a Q of 10 in order to get to a Q of 20, a Q of 30, and so on and so forth. But there's no electrical generator on site. In a commercial fusion facility, you would need to convert that output heat to electricity probably using steam generators like typical nuclear fission plants. Yep. That part of the process is pretty well understood, so it's not a part of this research facility. Instead, Eater needs a way to dissipate all that heat energy they hope the fusion will create. That's the job of the water cooling system and the enormous heat removal zone. nearby. Water is circulated around the tokamak and then to the tower okay, so where cooling it can towers. reject all that heat into the atmosphere. Presumably condenser. That brings us back to where we started the tokamak complex itself. That machine, once it's finished, will weigh an astounding 23,000 tons, more than most freight trains. And with all the heating and cooling going on, there are some serious challenges in- That's big. Again, that's big for a relatively small power source. Just holding the thing up. As the tokamak is cooled cryogenically, it shrinks, but the building stays the same size. And actually, we had to uh, we had to find out some solution to decouple physically the movement of the machine and the building. And for that purpose, we we designed some specific uh, bearings allowing displacement, but keeping always the capacity to to support and to restrain the machine. So it's one important thing. I could speak about that hours because <laughs> we, uh, yes, it was a. Uh, Extra, it was maybe one of the most challenging parts we had in the design of the building. Anything with like reactor vessel assembly, reactor head assembly, it's like one of the most complicated evolutions during a refueling outage. And this is routine. At the plant I've worked at, we've done these refueling outages 50 times, something like that. And this is everything's a first time. Everything is bigger. Everything is this weird customized shape that has never been done before. So yeah, that's going to be pretty hard. The support of the machine, which is quite simple when now it is built, but uh, to to reach this uh, this robust uh, supporting system, it took uh, years. And because you know this is an actual nuclear reactor. It has to follow all the safety regulations of any nuclear power plant. Yep. No one will be inside the tokamak complex when it's running. Which is weird. And I know it's weird for someone like me to say that, but the, the vulnerabilities in a fusion reactor are completely different than ones of a fission reactor. Like the whole, a lot of things are designed around decay heat, which isn't, which isn't a thing in fusion. And the release of fission products. Fusion products don't have that same thing. Helium, you could vent to atmosphere. It's a noble gas that isn't radioactive. In fact, helium is one of the most stable elements ever. That's why alpha particles is a helium nucleus, because it is a natural stable state for bits and pieces to decay off of things. It's just a natural, it's just a good little, little chunk 
of uh, nuclear matter that comes off of a nucleus. So I think now as far as like, you know, the ASME class piping or whatever the French equivalent of that is um, and all of the structural and civil requirements, I can see that. Sure, because that's not that doesn't really change very much and like seismic design requirements. But as far as how you combat accidents, it's a it's a completely different game. Be nearby in a separate control building physically distant from the reactor and the complex itself has been engineered to withstand a host of disastrous conditions, from floods to plane crashes to explosions on the nearby highway. Like all nuclear power plants, it has a containment structure mm -hmm. to confine any fusion products that might be released into the atmosphere in the event of an accident, and that's made using a special concrete formula developed over two years just for this application that contains fusion extra products heavy crack me up. That term cracks me up. to provide radioactive shielding. So you can see the dark, the... The main, react, the main sources of radiation are going to be the reactants rather than the products, the, uh, the deuterium and the tritium. Bill Gates with uh, content of iron inside, okay? And the white inclusion are colemanite, actually. And it's not just thermal movement the designers plan for, but seismic movement, too. Yep. <laughs> an earthquake could ruin the entire structure in an instant if the tokamak was violently shaken. So engineers had to get creative. And I can see that because you got this sensitive array of magnets, everything's got to be the temperature requirements are, I would say, harsher than a, than a um, fission reactor in that you got to keep things cry cryogenically cooled and things to like ultra hot, hotter than the sun temperatures. So, yeah, there's there's more of that going on compared to uh, fission. One thing uh, I need to, to mention as well, that the Tokamak complex building is built on uh, elastomeric bearings for seismic, uh, for seismic uh, reason, allowing to uh, decouple as much as possible horizontal movement of the soil with the, with the building. And we have 493 anti-seismic bearings, the same type of bearing that you can see underneath bridges. So these seismic bearings, um, during every refueling outage, these seismic bearings have to be checked in a fission reactor during every refueling outage, and it has such a periodicity that is specified that it's it's federal law. It's in accordance with the technical specifications of the uh, of the nuclear plant. So I could see a similar requirement for fusion. Okay, so much larger, ninety by ninety centimeter, uh, twenty uh, eighteen centimeter high, but we have a forest of. Uh, uh, Please supporting those uh, anti seismic bearings, and then the, all the building is rotating on the anti seismic bearings. It's incredible, incredible. It's exciting right now to see countries across the world collaborating on such a grand scale to in. It is. I I really do like seeing um, the progress we've made, just the amount of uh, collaboration we're seeing for fusion. Such a grand scale to invest in the long term future of energy infrastructure. That's the right attitude. Long-term investments. That's one of the reasons why um, people are more hesitant to invest in nuclear because it, building these structures take a long time. Even a uh, commercial fission nuclear power plant takes a while. But once we get more of these, I'm uh, I'm confident we can have more have more fusion reactors, some small modular reactors, and eventually fusion. But we just have to think more long term as, as a species. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.